Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that you're here with us. We're grateful for your invitation. We're grateful for your grace. And now we pray, Lord, that the words of our mouths, the thoughts of our hearts will please you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. So, guys, never doubt. Doubt God, doubt Jesus, maybe. Some guys even doubt that Jesus existed, which is flat out crazy. But have you ever doubted that Jesus went around working miracles, raising the dead, being raised from the dead? You ever wonder about that? Although if there really is a God, it's kind of weird to deny the possibility of miracle or even resurrection, right? But have you ever wondered whether Jesus really was God in a bod, like he claimed to be? What would it take to convince you? What would it take for you to acknowledge that Jesus really is the Son of God, the Lord, the Savior of all? Would you claim to be? Would you doubt Jesus if you saw him right now, right here? Would you accept his claim to be God, the truth of what he says? Would you do whatever he tells you to do? Or would you still look for loopholes? Because we love loopholes, right? There's this really weird scene in the New Testament. Early Sunday morning, these women go to the tomb of Jesus, expecting to find a dead body to tend. He's been dead since Friday, they thought. Now, Jesus had actually told them that he would be crucified, buried, and that he would walk out of his tomb on Sunday. They didn't buy it, because they came to tend his corpse. And the disciples didn't believe that Jesus was going to raise from the dead. They weren't there at the tomb, waiting expectantly. Their hopes and their dreams were dead, just like Jesus, they thought. So when the women get to the tomb, the tomb is open, empty, kind of, because instead of Jesus, they find an angel, which scares the bejeegers out of them. Angels are good at that. And the angel says, you guys are here looking for Jesus, right? You understand that you're dorks, right? I added that part, but it's there. (laughs) Jesus told you he wasn't going to stay dead. Now go tell the disciples, because they're dorks too, right? Hiding? Go tell them that Jesus is going to meet them up north in Galilee. Well, they run, wouldn't you? And they run smack into Jesus, who is very much alive. Scared the bejiggers out of him. He says, don't be afraid. Go tell the disciples that I'm going to meet him up north in Galilee. And here's what happens. This is weird. Matthew says the disciples go to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw Jesus, who was very much alive, they worshipped him. No kidding. Wouldn't you? Because if a man who claims to be the Son of God, who claims to be your Savior and your Lord, predicts his death and his resurrection and then pulls it off, standing right in front of you, you'd worship him, right? But here it is, and this is what's so weird. Matthew says, some of them doubted. Doubted what? I mean, Jesus is standing right there. Matthew says, all of them worshipped and some of them doubted. Now, when we think about disciples who doubted, we usually think about Thomas, but this is more than just Thomas. And what in the world are they doubting? But the very next verse, Jesus just blows right past their doubts. He says, okay, guys, now go. You have work to do. You have a story to tell. There are lives that need changing. And so they went. And here it is. They worshiped, they doubted, and they obeyed. And they changed the world. So they worshipped, they doubted, and they obeyed, all while looking at a resurrected Jesus. That's kind of weird. But it's also a little bit familiar. How many of us fluctuate between worship and doubt and obedience? And look, we don't get to see Jesus face to face, but there is some powerful evidence as to why we can believe in this resurrection. It isn't doubt-proof. I can't 
prove to you that Jesus rose from the dead. I can't remove all of your doubt. It takes faith no matter what. It takes faith to believe and it takes faith to deny. In fact, I think it takes more faith to not believe in the resurrection of Jesus because there is a ton of evidence. More than we can cover in a single sermon, by far, there are volumes of books written on this kind of stuff. And so this morning, we're just going to kind of skim past the tip of the iceberg. We're going to look at physical evidence and testimonial evidence and circumstantial evidence, which sounds like courtroom talk, and you may already be zoning out. Stick with us, because this is a big deal. If a man really raised from the dead, if God raised Jesus from the dead, then it changes everything before and after. So first, this physical evidence. It's pretty simple to start with. There was an empty tomb. On Friday, they put a body in a tomb. They sealed it with a stone. They put guards in front of it to prevent tampering. On Sunday, the body was gone. Linens neatly folded where the body should have laid. What happened to the body? The empty tomb became the central point of this movement that was started. Just weeks later, we have disciples who were once scared and once in hiding are now suddenly, confidently, publicly preaching a risen Jesus. And they were doing so in the same town where Jesus died. And they were preaching to the same people who watched it happen. This isn't some story that was made up years later. This was something that was preached immediately. All that the enemies of this movement had to do to shut these guys up was produce a body. Just take them to the tomb. They could have stopped Christianity before it ever got going if they simply rolled the stone away and revealed the body, but they didn't because they couldn't. Actually, the enemies of Jesus and his followers never denied an empty tomb. Instead, they tried to explain it away. Again, all they needed to do was produce a body, but they couldn't, so they made up a story that the disciples had stolen the body, which is... A little bit crazy, because all of the disciples are eventually killed for this story. Don't you think that if they knew where they'd hid the body, that maybe one of them would have caved and confessed? It's not just that the physical evidence of the tomb, it's, it's the story itself. The story is wild. The story has all these marks of historical accuracy. It's wild, but truth can be stranger than fiction. The Gospels say that the tomb was discovered by women, which isn't a real big deal today, but a huge deal in Jesus' time when women were considered worthless in regard of their testimony. Back then, no one would have made up a story using women to discover an empty tomb, but truth can be stranger than fiction, right? And the accounts of the resurrection are so straightforward. There's no frills. There's, there's, you know, there's no, nothing extra that's made up, nothing imaginative. A made-up story would have answered all these other extra questions we have, like how did Jesus do it? What did it look like? What did Jesus look like? What did it look like when he first got breath? But the story we have is pretty simple and straightforward, like truth, not legend. And the the gospel accounts all differ, which sounds like a crack in the story, right? It sounds like a hit to their credibility. But there's some science behind this idea of first-person testimony, and it's too much for us to get into here, but just to make it very simple, if all the details matched between everyone's stories, it would sound like collusion. The fact that there's big, te- big details that match and there's little ones that differ actually adds credibility. There's even a few who suggest that Jesus, maybe he just didn't even die. They think that he woke up in a cool, damp tomb and has the strength to move the stone and then overwhelm the guards and walk away. Sounds ridiculous, right? Because it is. The evidence says that the tomb really was empty. The disciples didn't steal it. The body didn't remain in a tomb while these stories started populating. A resurrection happened. The tomb was empty. And God can do things like that. Even so, the disciples doubted. Even so, we doubt. But the disciples also worshipped and obeyed. They worshipped, they doubted, and they obeyed. How about you? Think of that movement. They worshipped, they doubted, and they obeyed. Now, there are some who let their doubts overwhelm their worship and their obedience. Because, guys, if you don't want to follow Jesus, evidence is not going to convince you. 
It's not going to remove your doubts. Do you buy that? I do. So there are some who are going to keep on doubting regardless of the evidence. Bottom line, there are different kinds of doubters. Truth is, many Jesus followers struggle with doubt from time to time. I'm one of them. I have. Maybe some of you guys. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. Honest doubt is not the enemy of faith. doesn't have to be. But if it is unchallenged, it can steal your hope, your joy, and your peace. Do not let your doubts steal your hope, your joy, and your peace. Do not let your doubts inhibit your worship or hinder your obedience. You might even want to pray one of the great prayers of the New Testament where this guy says, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Others use their doubts. They let their doubts move them to avoiding Jesus. Maybe some of you guys. See, God never forces anybody to to, to believe in him. If you don't want to follow Jesus, he's going to let you find a reason. Jesus can be annoying, and he won't compromise with you. His agenda is different than yours. His moral code is different than yours. And he's not going to settle for a compromise. He's not going to settle for a partnership with you. He thinks he's like God, right? And so often, quite often, people use doubts to avoid following Jesus. And there are others who actually let their doubts harden into hate. When your doubts harden, not even a miracle will change your mind. Not even Easter will change your mind. There are Jewish leaders like that in the Jesus story. They disagreed with Jesus about God. They disagreed with Jesus about what it means to follow God. And they were threatened because people were listening to Jesus and not them. Not even a miracle could sway them. You can see it in the story. One time there was a guy who was demon-possessed, brought to Jesus. Jesus ordered the demons out because God can do that. And these religious leaders are like, that's not God. He's getting his power from Satan. They refuse to believe. Guys, if you don't want to believe, you will find a reason not to, no matter how strong the evidence is. Another time Jesus actually raised a guy from the dead. And these religious leaders didn't deny the miracle. They couldn't. I mean, Lazarus is just standing there. But instead of worshiping and obeying Jesus, they began plotting to kill him. Guys, if you don't want to believe in Jesus, you're going to find a reason not to, even if he stands before you face to face. So the real question is this. Do you want to believe in Jesus? Do you want to? And if not, why not? Because the Jesus story is a stunning story of both truth and grace. Do you want to believe in Jesus? It's going to take faith to follow Jesus. But guys, it's going to take more faith not to. Because the evidence for Jesus is so powerful. These disciples worshipped, they doubted, and they still obeyed. Can you? So the disciples worshipped, they doubted, and they obeyed all while looking at a resurrected Jesus. Now, I know that we don't get the opportunity to see Jesus face to face, but the eyewitness testimony is so powerful, guys. It's powerful evidence. And the fact is, there was a large contingent of eyewitnesses to a resurrected Jesus. Lots of people saw him and ate with him and hugged him and talked to him repeatedly for weeks. He was seen by people who loved him and by people who were skeptical people who doubted and it became the truth that people were willing to die for he appeared to mary magdalene and to a second mary and he appeared to the mother of one of his disciples and other women who were with them his resurrection was for everyone he appeared to a guy named cleopas and his friend and he walked with them and he taught them and he ate with them He appeared to his disciples regularly and repeatedly. We have record of at least six different times that Jesus appeared to his disciples over uh, over a period of at most six to seven weeks. He appeared to groups and he appeared to individuals. We have the accounts of Jesus' appearance to both Peter, who had denied him, and to Paul, who was persecuting Jesus' followers until he had his own encounter with Jesus. We'll talk about more of that in a moment. Probably the most convincing and significant appearance is to Jesus' own brother, James. We'll talk more about him in a moment as well. One time, Jesus appears to a crowd of more than 500 people at once. And these people 
were still alive when these stories started circulating because they circulated immediately, not years later. So when we say that Jesus resurrected, we aren't talking only about an empty tomb or even a few different experiences maybe a couple people had. There is a weight of evidence here. And it's not shaky testimony. These people touched him and talked with him, ate with him, inside and outside, in town and out of town for weeks. And then they saw him leave. Seven weeks after Jesus is killed and resurrected, seven weeks after the disciples are scattered and hide for their own lives, seven weeks later, this group of uneducated, fearful, underqualified men boldly preach publicly about a risen Messiah. They didn't preach about a good man. They didn't, they didn't lead people to a good teacher. They preached God resurrected. And they were willing to die for it. And I know some people still think that this is a scam that doesn't hold. Some people think that this story became bigger and bigger as time passed, kind of turning into legend. It won't work either. Some people think that that maybe it was just some mass hallucinations because they wanted Jesus back so badly. It just doesn't add up. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. But still... For so many, evidence, no matter how strong, will never be enough to remove their doubts. Some of the disciples had their doubts as well. Even so, they worshipped and obeyed. There it is. They worshipped, some doubted, and they obeyed. It describes a whole lot of Jesus followers here at Capital City. You know, even those who have accepted the rock-solid evidence that Jesus really is the Son of God, the Savior, the Lord, even they can have periods of doubt. Here's one of the weirdest scenes in the New Testament. There's a guy named John the Baptist. He's in prison for dissing the king. John the Baptist is actually Jesus' cousin. We're told that when both their mamas were pregnant, John somehow leaped in the womb when Jesus entered the room. And later on, when crowds were flocking to hear John preach, John kept telling him, someone is coming who is way bigger than me. And when he sees Jesus, he said, he's the one that I've been talking about. He is the one who's going to take away the sins of the world. And when John baptizes Jesus, he actually sees the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove and landing on Jesus. And he hears the voice of God saying, this Jesus is my son. So John was about as fierce a believer in Jesus as they come. And yet a couple of years later, when John is in prison, a couple of years later when Jesus wasn't out there doing the kind of things he expected the Messiah to do, a couple of years later, even John doubted. And he sends guys to Jesus with this question, are you really the one that I thought you were? Are you really the Messiah? And Jesus answered, yeah, I am. I'm not the kind of Messiah that you expected but yes, I am. And John sends, or Jesus sends a message back to John, and I think the message Jesus sent calmed his doubts. But in a way, guys, what John had seen, despite all that, he had more reason to doubt than we do. You know why? Because John didn't have the one huge piece that we've got. He didn't have the resurrection from the dead. He didn't have Easter. Because listen, guys, If a guy claims to be the Son of God, the Savior and the Lord, and he predicts his death and his resurrection three days later, which he did at least three times, and then he pulls it off, I'd worship and I'd obey him even if I had doubts from time to time. Their story is our story. They worshiped, some doubted, and they still obeyed. Even serious followers of Jesus battled doubt from time to time. But as we walk back through the reasons we believe, we rediscover how strong those reasons are. And so we're just highlighting, you know, the three kinds of evidence. We've talked about the physical evidence of the empty tomb. We've talked about the multiple credible eyewitness accounts. And there is a ton of circumstantial evidence as well. And it may be the most powerful and significant evidence of all. Three different times that we know of Jesus predicted his death and resurrection on the third day. No one believed him. 
No one understood. No one was waiting at the tomb for the show. Instead, women showed up with spices for a dead body. Men didn't show up at all. They were in hiding. And yet all these guys who had lost all hope have this radical change of heart and this infusion of reckless courage. In fact, they died for their commitment to a resurrected Jesus. We've mentioned that now a few times. I don't want you to miss how significant that statement is, okay? People die for things that they believe in all the time. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what this was. This is different. The disciples didn't die for something that they believed. They died for something that they saw, something that they experienced. We don't have a single account of anyone claiming to see a resurrected Jesus recanting that testimony. The record shows that they carried the story to their death, hundreds of people sticking with it to the end. Because if a guy calls his death and resurrection and then he pulls it off, it's probably the biggest thing to ever happen in history. And so these Jesus followers abandoned their jobs and their security. They committed the rest of their lives to preaching Jesus with no earthly payoff. And they actually did so at a cost. There were times when they went without food. They were ridiculed. They were beaten and imprisoned. Many were executed all because they held on to the truth of the resurrection. They had no ulterior motives, nothing to gain, a ton to lose. Skeptics turned into believers. We already mentioned Paul. He was a leader of the Jews, a persecutor of the church. He actually traveled with the purpose of murdering Christians. And then one day he becomes a Jesus follower. And then he continues to travel thousands of miles. And most of the time he was suffering from hunger or the elements and other countless dangers. He gets jailed repeatedly and whipped repeatedly and stoned repeatedly. He had his head cut off for preaching this Jesus that he had once hated. What would cause a man to have such a drastic change? He said he saw the resurrected Messiah. Probably the most convincing and significant reversal is from Jesus' own brother James. Jesus' family was confused by him. They were embarrassed by him. They even confronted him. But then, then James turns around and becomes a believer. In fact, he becomes a leader in the church because James saw his brother alive. And that's what it would take, right? If your brother claimed to be God, you would probably need to see him raised from the dead. Right? Right? James wrote a letter that became part of our New Testament. Later, he was stoned to death because he believed his brother. Because if a man calls his death and resurrection and then pulls it off, it could change some things. His disciples died for what they saw. His enemies were transformed by what they saw. And the church movement grew exponentially from the very beginning. There's no way in the world that a group of obscure, poverty-stricken misfits should have changed the world especially when their message is about a homeless carpenter who was crucified publicly. These guys weren't the pick of the litter. They were all runts, all of them. Yet in 20 years, there were churches all throughout the Roman Empire. And today, we name our children Mary and Philip and Thomas and James and Peter and Paul. Why? Because a man rose from the grave and it changed lives and people flocked to this movement because maybe for the first time they understood God loved them and had proven it. But some doubted. Some still doubt. Sometimes I still doubt. Because God lets you find your reasons if you really don't want to to believe. God never forces himself on us. Because of that, guys, even the fiercest Jesus followers struggle with doubt occasionally. Even the disciples standing right in the presence of Jesus. Because we're bullheaded creatures, right? And Jesus is standing there. He had been crucified. He was very, very dead. Buried because he was dead. And now he's standing right in front of them. So they worship him. No kidding. But Matthew says, and Matthew was there, he says, some of those who worshipped him doubted. 
What? Why? Were they doubting that Jesus had actually died on that cross? But that's irrational. Was his physical uh, resurrection simply too much for their brains to process, to accept? Were they thinking that maybe they were in the middle of a mass hallucination or a mass psychosis? Would you question your sanity before you accept Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Were they going into a detective mode? Maybe this is a body double. Maybe it's a ghost. Or maybe, if this really is Jesus, that means we abandoned him when we needed him most. If this really is Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, the Lord, which it looks like now, we abandoned him at the moment he tried preparing us for. And the immensity of their betrayal could have crushed them, seeing Jesus standing right in front of them. Because, guys, if this really is Jesus raised from the dead, that, doesn't that mean that all of his claims and his promises and demands, doesn't Easter mean that we better take him seriously? Doesn't it? But despite their doubts, they worshipped him. No kidding. Do you? Despite their doubts, they obeyed him. Do you? And why does Matthew mention this at all? Why does he mention their doubts? And how would he know that they even doubted unless others, perhaps like him, were open about it? It takes guts. One of the reasons that we trust these gospel stories is that the writers were so honest. Why does he mention their doubts at all? He just drops it in there. And then he blows right on by. Is it that even though their minds were blown, they were smart enough to worship and smart enough to obey? Is he trying to tell us something? Guys, most believers have doubts from time to time, and God is not threatened by honest doubt, if it's honest. He won't force himself on us yet, which means that sometimes we will doubt. It does require faith to follow Jesus, but in light of the evidence, it takes even more faith not to. The key is, even though their minds were blown, they worshipped him. And even though their minds were blown, they obeyed him. To the man, to the death. Will you? It will take faith. But there's more than enough evidence for those who are willing to believe. There's more than enough evidence for those who want to believe. There's even enough evidence for those who want to want to believe. Guys, if you battle doubts from time to time, keep worshipping. If you battle doubts from time to time, keep on obeying. He'll give you more than enough to keep on and it will be worth it forever. See, we treat doubt like it's so shameful. You know what's actually worse than doubting? It's when we believe with our heads but not our hearts. It's saying that you believe but then marginalizing him. It's saying you believe but then living like he doesn't matter. That's crazy that's shameful because if God raised Jesus from the dead his teachings are more than just neat ideas from a wise teacher they are divine truths upon which I can build my life some of you guys have no doubts at all how cool is that God bless you just be patient with those of us who do from time to time some of you guys are Jesus followers and you have doubts from time to time Our job is to keep worshiping and keeping on obeying. God is not offended by honest doubt unless you are looking for a reason not to believe. Just be honest. He will give you enough to hang on. It takes faith to believe in Jesus, to believe in God. It takes more faith not to. He will not answer all of your questions because he's God. But he'll give you enough. But there are some guys, maybe some of you guys, who are looking for a reason not to believe. You're not looking for an answer, you're looking for questions. Guys, if you really want to believe, you will discover more than enough to follow him. If you don't want to believe, your problem is not with the evidence, your problem is with your heart. Think about it, guys. If Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection and pulled it off, I think that means he is the way, the truth, and the life. Just like he claimed to be. 
if God raised Jesus from the dead, that means that he's alive today. And that a relationship with him is open to every one of us. And you can take his promise to the bank, the promise that he offers victory over death for those who trust in him. He can do it. Guys, listen. If Jesus knew that he was going to die for you and for me, and he went to the cross anyway on purpose, that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt how much God values you, how much he cares, how much he loves you. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain by following him. If God really did raise Jesus from the dead, then he deserves our worship and our obedience, even in the midst of our doubt. He deserves it, however, whenever, wherever, whatever he wants of us, he deserves it, and we're in. Are you in? Are you willing to make this most important decision of your life? Today's a great day to celebrate resurrection, not just of what happened in a tomb thousands of years ago, but what's happening in this room right now. The same spirit who worked in that tomb is the same spirit that's willing to work in you right now and bring you to new life. If you need to make that decision, let's have that conversation over the course of this next song. Doc and I will be sitting right up front. We would love to talk to you about what it looks like to start a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you want to do so afterwards, have a larger conversation. That's fine. We'll be up front afterwards. We've got an elder in our prayer room who'd love to pray with you. We've got someone in the connections room who'd love to have that conversation with you out in the foyer. Guys, every opportunity is sitting in front of you. The Holy Spirit's working and he'll nudge. Will you respond? Will this be a day of resurrection for you? Why don't you stand? Let's sing.